free. Amen. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we've already said that Jesus has invited us to come. And that's, you know, I, I, the more I think on this uh, passage of Scripture, and it seems as though it comes up every time I sit down to, to prepare, you know, that, that He has invited to come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Who doesn't that include? I mean, just think about it. Do you know any human beings that don't carry some load? I mean, there may be some, you know, that, that you know, are free of that. But nobody escapes suffering. Nobody escapes difficulty. Nobody escapes all the stuff that earth has for us. So the invitation is for who? Everybody. Whoever has problems, let him come. Let him come. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And in that we see, you know, I, I just wrote down a little, a little phrase that kind of sums up some of the things that I'm going to be looking at today. And, and, and it's just real simple. It says, when he wrapped himself in flesh, he unwrapped himself to us. He wrapped himself in flesh, but when he did that, he revealed who he really is. And this is the amazing thing about the Lord. The God who is high and exalted, the God who is beyond all our imagination, the God who slung all the universe into existence with all of its thousands and unknown amounts of galaxies and everything that he did, this great, this high, lofty God is at heart humble and meek. How can it be? Our world doesn't think that way. Our world thinks the big, the big dog rules the roost. And God is the big dog, but he's... Can I say that about God? Wait a minute, I'm, wait, that might not be right. God is the, the big dog. You know what I mean anyway. You know, the analogy's not so great, but nonetheless, you know who I'm talking about and who he is. He rules everything. He is Lord over all, and yet... He wraps himself in flesh, and in wrapping himself in flesh, reveals his very heart to us. So there's a wrapping and an unwrapping in the same work. And that's what we're looking at today. The marvel of this incarnation. And the, the fact that God was born into the human circumstance. That God himself clothed himself with flesh, came down from his loft, if you will, in the heavens, and dwelt among us, Emmanuel, God with us. So many people say, show me God. All i got to do is say, Jesus. I don't understand why people even ask that question. <coughs> because it's so easy to answer. It's for, at least for a Christian. <laughs> because we know that God clothed himself in flesh. And as I said last week, uh, Jesus responding to, to Philip. You know, show, show us the Father. And he said, Philip, have I been? You know, he probably had hair to pull, had to pull out. He was only 30 years old. You know, <laughs> Philip, have I been with you such a long time and you still don't know me? If you've seen me, you have seen what? The Father. If you, nobody's saying, if you've seen me, you have seen God. You have seen God. And if you have seen Jesus walking through the pages of the Bible, the things that he did, the things that he said, this is the heart of God displayed for us. This is who he is in all of his holiness, in all of his purity, in all of his judgment, in all of his goodness, mercy, and kindness, both sides. Behold, Paul said, the goodness and the severity of God. The goodness towards those who repent and walk with him, severity towards those who reject and hate him. This is him. I love what John said, and I won't steal Alex's thunder, but he said when he saw Jesus walking, Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, look, look, Amen. the Lamb of God. Look at him. Take the time to concentrate. Take the time to think. So nowhere do we see the humble heart and mind of Jesus. I, I think manifest more or or written about better <laughs> let me put it that way is in Paul's writing in Philippians 2 6 through 8 he said of Jesus who being in the form of God being God huh? in the form of God 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Paul is saying that Jesus Christ is equal to God. In other words, he is God. Being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to say, I am God. He wasn't, he, he was not usurping. That would probably be, I don't know, is that a better word? Do you get that word more than like robbery? I mean, I know you know what robbery is, but the idea is more usurping authority. Taking a which means taking authority that does not belong to you. I am the father of my house. I don't need you coming over to father my children. Unless I'm a horrible father. You see what I'm saying? The father was sent there by God to father the household. If somebody comes along and usurps the father's authority, that is not a good thing. Jesus claiming to be God is not usurping authority. He is simply making the claim that is true. He is deity. And we were talking about that last week. Jesus is God, the deity. And that has to be driven home to us because this week we're going to be talking more about his humanity. And, and you know, we talked a little bit last week and I said that Jesus is all God all the time and, and since he was born into the earth as he, he was born impregnated by the Holy Spirit he will be man all the time from that time not diminishing his deity one iota he will be the God man forever he will never stop being man and, and his being man doesn't diminish him being God and him being God doesn't um how would I say it? Doesn't um, uh, what's the right word that I'm looking for? And it doesn't diminish humanity. Let's put it that way. It doesn't. It doesn't take anything away from it. He he holds both of them together. God, man, together. God, man, together. And that will be that way forever. And you'll see as we go on tonight that will be a very important point that we're going to make because we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus is our high priest. And the whole fact that he was made flesh and came to earth to dwell here amongst us is very important for that high priestly ministry, as, we, as we'll see and as, as we'll open it up. But let me get back to this first and kind of develop it as I ought. So, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Um, other translations say he emptied himself, okay, which has created a lot of questioning. As far as, well, how much did he empty himself? And, you know, did he stop being God? Was he God, all God, and, and all man at the same time? And, you know, a, a lot of questions that have arisen from that. I'm not really going to get into that discussion and, and, and so on and so forth. But I will make some comments. So he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. The whole idea there was he didn't grasp. He didn't, he didn't look at it as something that he had to hold on to to be true to himself. <laughs> he let it go. <clears throat> and often it is such an example for us in life to be able to let go of what we feel is or what may truly be what is rightfully ours. And we are, we are amongst a people, a nation, to whom our rights <laughs> mean everything. They mean everything. I, it's my right for this and it's my right for that and I have the right to do this and the right to do that. And we even have so many different rights today that your rights step on my rights. And we're having all kinds of problems as to whose rights are the right rights. <laughs> but Jesus, when he looked at rights, even the right of being equal with God, because that's who he is, he, he said, ah, I can let go of that. <laughs> because I have a purpose in mind. I'm going to save humanity from their sins and from destruction and from hell eternal. I'm going to lay all of that aside. He could set it aside to accomplish the will of the Father. Now that's called following Jesus. When you get that about who Jesus is, and you can say, I am willing to put down my preferences, my rights, so that I can fulfill the will of God, or just be a good husband. <laughs> I don't always have to have the last piece of pie. Sometimes I take the last piece of pie. I do, I admit it, I acknowledge it, I do. When nobody's around, I do. I go in, I snatch that last piece of pie, and they, and they ask, "Who got the last piece of pie?" And I say nothing. 
<laughs> I just get quiet. I'm trying to get more like Jesus, right? I'm trying to get more like him. He had this ability to lay stuff down. He, and he could lay down that whole thing. To what extent he laid it down, you know, you're getting into a huge can of worms there. That doesn't seem to me to be really all that <coughs> It doesn't seem to be that powerful to me, looking into all that. So anyway, he took upon himself the form of servant. He was made in the likeness of men. It says, the Bible says that we were made in the likeness of God. Here we have the, the amazing flip on that. God is now made how? In the likeness of man. That's a pretty amazing thing. He flipped the whole equation. He elevated man by giving us a spirit and putting us into relationship with him so, and created us in such a manner that we could relate to him, commune with him, love him, enjoy him. But that was all broken down. And God said, okay, now I have to come and be made in your likeness to reestablish the connection we had previously. I'm going to bring you back into fellowship with me, but I've got to take on your likeness to be able to do it without diminishing at all his deity. He was made in the likeness of man, men, and being found in fashion as a man, now this is amazing, huh? he humbled himself, and how was his humility ex ex um, experienced or expressed? He became obedient unto death. Now, this, there's, there's, a, there's such a thing as a feeling of humility, you know, that we, we have a deep sense in our hearts of being humble before God. I've talked back about today, but we're talking about being, being broken before the Lord, you know, when we sin, when we, and we have to acknowledge that we have done these things. But there, there, there's more to it than that sense or that sorrow of sin that we feel. You know, when we sin, uh, sometimes there's a heavy sorrow that comes upon us. And, you know, and we weep. And we, we, we weep before the Lord. Sometimes it's, it's less heavy. But nonetheless, there is a, a sense of sorrow. And that's, that's a good thing. And it's a humbling experience. But the greatest, the greatest manifestation of humility is when I obey what the Lord has said. Why? Because from the get-go, I'm saying, Father, Thou knowest. Thou knowest. And it is for me to simply fall in behind you and follow you. I'm not questioning God, at, sometimes I do, at every turn. You know what I'm saying? When God says, look, this is how I have prescribed things to be done in family, in marriage, in a relationship, at your work. When he says, do it this way, then I just do it. I take it at face value because I know who he is. Trust in the Lord, right, with all your heart. Lean not to what? Your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your path. That's the human, that's the humble heart. And that's what Jesus was manifesting. That is the humility that He was manifesting. Yes, that He took upon flesh, but more so that He, he surrendered to the Father's will for His life. I've not come to do my will, I have come to do Thy will. What did He teach us? Not my will be done, but, uh, but Thy will be done. What did He teach us to pray? Father, thy will be done right. on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Everything about Jesus bellows out. Not what we want, but what you want, Father. Yeah. And if we're going to be Jesus followers, that has to become the number one focus in our lives. The things, the thing that we're willing to die and live for. Mm -hmm. What do you want from me? What would you that I do? The first thing, Paul, when he gets knocked off of that horse, what's his first question? Who are you, right? That was the first question. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's tough for you to kick against these goats. Yes, it is. Lord, what would you have me to do? First question, when he realized who he was talking to and that he was the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the life was about to change, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, what would you have me to do? That's, that's a Christ follower. That's a, your life is lost. I, I, I'm, I'm, this is not my notes. I'm going to give you my notes. But I sense the Spirit of God moving in this and just speaking it to us that we, we really need 
to be true disciples of Jesus. People who really get to the place where we're willing to lay down our comfy, cozy stuff places, circumstances for the following of Christ. Not for, not for just depriving ourselves of stuff. <laughs> you understand? But living in a state of heart and mind whereby that stuff is not an impediment to me following the, the, the wind of God. If God were to so move me, all that stuff should just, I mean, without effort, effortlessly slip aside. Amen. I can remember times sitting in, in, in my backyard. I love sitting in my backyard in the morning, having my cup of coffee early morning, 4, 5, 6 o'clock, whatever it may be. Birds, rabbits, squirrels, which I don't like so much. Nonetheless, they're there. And just, you know, thinking about things and thinking about, you know, the house that the Lord gave it. And, and, and I say, Lord, Lord, I'll burn it to the ground tomorrow if you call me. You call me to go, I'll burn this thing to the ground. This will not be an impediment to me. I, have, I will not be anchored by anything. Amen. But by the voice of God. And wherever that voice leads, I will follow. I don't care. Is this kind of scary stuff? I don't know. It's just normal Christianity, really. Mm -hmm. I'm a little excited about it here tonight. But that's just normal yeah. Christianity. You know, we've whooped it up to say that's radical Christianity. It's not radical Christianity. It's normal Christianity. It has been ever since Jesus died on the cross and said, follow me. I'm giving you my example. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to what? Death. <laughs> Even the death on the cross. And then what did he say to you and me? Pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up, and some people think, well, that's you know, that's for Pastor Carl, that's for Pastor Bob, that's for you know, that's for the people, that's for you know, no, no, it's for you. <laughs> for all, hey, Harold, it's for you, brother, it's for you. Pick up that cross, follow him, follow him, follow him. Hallelujah. Amen. So, it's through the incarnation, God coming down, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit through incarnation, where God Almighty wrapped himself in, in the flesh of mere mortals that we see the true depths of his heart. That's worth seeing. It's an amazing, it's an amazing view. I'm not interested in trying to figure it out. <laughs> People get tripped up with the doctrine of, of the incarnation or the fact of Jesus becoming flesh probably more than than any other doctrine. It's just one of those things where polite people and smart people look at it and say, well, that's impossible. Well, I look at it and say, well, what's impossible with God? If God is the one who created all that we know and yeah. see and are now seeing more and more of through this huge telescope that we're getting and the ability to go deeper and deeper into the seas and experience and, 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 and know all of this stuff. If the one that created all of that actually created all that, what's the big deal about an incarnation? Yes. Amen. Amen. What's, the, what's the big deal about a resurrection? I don't <laughs> understand it. It's just God being God. Can you do it? No! And that's what irks us. We can't do it. We can't change who we are. We can't become something else. And, and we can't breathe new life into our own hearts. But God can and did and does. Amen. Every time that someone turns to the Lord, resurrection power is released. The power to resurrect a dead man. The power to bring a, a man who hated God one minute into a loving relationship the next. A man to bring a, 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 a power and expect to bring a man who, who rebelled against God into the yoke of obedience. I, I think that's where the real power of God is demonstrated. When God gets a hold of rebels like you and me and he puts that yoke on us and we fight against it but he convinces us in our heart it's the right thing, it's the right way. And the next thing you know, I think God is the one that created form fit. And he put that yoke upon our, you know, and it just it just settles in on us. And it just it just feels right. 
it molds to our muscles, or maybe even a bit of the reverse, our muscles mold to it, right? And it's form-fitted, like you have a bed, you know, that's form-fitted. You jump in it, you get in the right position, and you're all set for the night. That's the way we gotta be with this yoke, this yoke of Jesus. I love the yoke of Jesus. I kick against it sometimes, just like you do. But I love that yoke of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's taught me so much. It's helped me to avoid so many foolish problems, silly things, all the drama that we see around us. I hate drama. You know what I'm saying? I know people who live drama. And if they don't have some drama, they're not living. I, 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 I hate drama. I, anyway, let me, let me get back to this. This is better than drama. <laughs> So he became one of us, sinless, always, always sinless, but nonetheless, one of us. Now, you may have the idea that, well, being a human being isn't such a bad deal. I mean, I can think of species that are a lot less couth than we are. I can think of, you know, things that are not so nice. Human beings, well, you know, we're, we're pretty good stuff. Well, hold on. <laughs> if you look to the right and you look to the left, and you make a comparison that way, okay, I, can, I get that. But if you start making vertical comparisons, in other words, you lift your eyes into the hills, <laughs> you lift your eyes to heaven, you lift your eyes to the maker, and then you start making comparisons, well, in reality, there is no comparison, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is no comparison between you and God, huh? between me and God, between us and God. He is exalted. He is high above. He is far beyond anything that we can even imagine in our lives. So he's sinless. He's holy. And he is beyond comparison. God tells us about himself that his thoughts and his ways are far above our thoughts and our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God also says in Isaiah, For thus saith the high, I love this language, and I love the way God uses it. Now, I wouldn't want you or, or, or I to use this language, but when God uses this language, it just, it just does something to me. It's like, yes, yes, that's, that's not only my God, that's my Father. Speak on, Lord. Thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy. I love when God gives that self-description of himself. High and lofty, I'm above all. Look, there's no competition between you and I because frankly, you're no competition. You're no competition. And I love it when God sets us in our place. He elevates us amazingly. In, in Psalm 8, I was meditating on it just this morning. He, he says, what is man? The psalmist says, after he's looking at all that God has created and meditating on the greatness of God, he says, but what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him, you come to him, you care for him. What is man? Why is it that you love us so much? That's what he's saying. I don't get it. So you're checking things out horizontally. He's like, man, that's so great. I'm okay, but the rest of these folks... <laughs> And then you get this vertical look, and then you, you're, you're, you're stupefied. You don't know how to respond when you, you get even a glimpse of his glory, even a glimpse of his power, even a, a little tiny gotita, huh? a little tiny drop. 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 Thank you. Who gave me that? Who said that? There you go. <laughs> little drop. De estilo, huh? De su gloria. Just a little drop of his glory, and you realize he is so much more than anything we could ever possibly be, and yet comes down, dwells amongst us, desires to enter into fellowship with us and be with us always and have us to be with him always. It's, it's mind-blowing. These are the things, you know, I really wish we would think on these things. It would make our daily lives a whole lot better. It's true. So he says, I'm the high and the lofty one. I inhabit eternity. My name is holy. So he is high, he is lofty, and he is holy. And it's obvious these words don't appear, appear, appeal to human beings. They're not, they're not applied to, rather, to human beings. But then, and, as, and I've, I've already said it, but let me finish what the verse says. 
He adds to that, that verse, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Huh? Who? You and me. If we will humble ourselves, he will dwell in the high and holy place with us. And then for what? To revive the spirit of the humble. He knows we get tired. He knows we have difficulty. He knows we lose strength. He knows. And he wants to revive the spirit of the humble. And then to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Those who have suffered sin. Con contrition is usually that, that sorrow for sin. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think I mentioned this in this class. But um, a lot of you know that my mom was uh, living for us. And I was trying to communicate the gospel to her one day. She's got dementia and she just, you know, doesn't. It's very difficult to do it, but I was talking to her about the blood of Jesus, and, and, and she was getting some of it and following some of it, and I was talking to her about, you know, it means, you know, that we need, we need forgiveness, and we need to do this and, 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 and get our lives right before God. And uh, I didn't know if it got in or not, but the next day, I'm sitting there. You remember this, Trisha? You probably do. We're, I'm sitting there. We were, we were, she's Catholic. You know, she uh, raised, born and raised Catholic, probably died Catholic, you know, all that kind of good stuff. But um, so at night, we would pray to our Father. You know, our Father, our in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that's, that's, her, that's her prayer. But this one night, like I say, it was like two days after um, I had talked to her about this stuff. Uh, we, we had a, a, like a baby microphone in her room, and then there's one in the kitchen and one upstairs in, in my bedroom. And I'm sitting there listening to Trish pray with my mom. And then my mom prays that prayer. And then the next thing you know, she goes into this other prayer. And, and, and I, said, I said, what is that? And she, it just came out of nowhere. And I said to Trish, I said, Trish, that had to be a prayer. What prayer was that? She goes, I don't know. I think it was the act of contrition. I think it was the act of contrition. And sure enough, I punch, you know, Google. <laughs> it's amazing. I punch in the act of contrition. Boom, it comes up. It is the act of contrition word for word. Word for word. And it, it, if you go and if you punch it in and, and read it, it's a great prayer. Because it's a prayer of repentance. And I'm sitting there thinking, how is it that my mom, who doesn't remember anything, after she's prayed the Lord's Prayer, after I talked to her two days before about it, all of a sudden bursts out of her heart, not provoked, and this prayer of contrition comes before the Father. I was dumbfounded. I was like, God receive that as her prayer of repentance. Amen. Receive that, Lord God. Something stirred on the inside of her. And I believe that was the moment and, 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 and that, that's the moment the Lord is, is, is going to use that. She just burst into it. It's a good prayer. That pr yes. Do you remember it? Yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you recite it? Maybe. <laughs> Try. Here on Google. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry. I yes. I haven't offended thee, but I detest all my sins because of thy just punishment. But most of all, because for of offending you, you, my Lord, who is all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to sin no more and to avoid the near occasions of sin. Amen. That is a prayer to be prayed. You, you hear what I'm saying? I mean, there's nothing wrong with prayers that are written out for us Pentecostal folk. That prayer will make goose pimples. On you. If you pray it from the heart, goose pimples, goose pimples, <laughs> bumps, goose bumps on you. If you pray it from the heart, just like it did with, you see how it moved Mark? I mean, he's trying to remember it and all that kind of stuff. I was 10 years old in catechism. <laughs> well, you learned it. Yeah. I was back there. But just imagine, here's my mom, and out of nowhere, she starts to pray that the thing that is the worst is that I have offended thee, the one that I love the most. I'm revising that. The one that I love the most, I have offended thee. This is the thing that hurts me the most. Amazing. Who is all good and deserving of all my love? Yes. <laughs> yeah. When you started, when you started to say, I said, "Yes, that's it. That's it." Oh man, it's just a wonderful, wonderful prayer. Okay, so to revive <laughs> those contrite ones, the 
high and lofty one has come and made himself into our likeness so that he could bring us back to himself. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't intend to come down to our level, right? He intends to come down to be made like unto us, sinless, to bring us back to what he had originally planned for us. And that's what he has done. So the humble heart of our God is in full display with the incarnation of Jesus. And I mentioned, you know, just a, a little bit, uh, and, and, I, and I think it's I think it's very important that we realize that for a lot of people, the incarnation is a problem. And if you look at some of the major religions today, like Islam, um, uh, Jehovah's Witness, I think the Mormons as well, none of these major religions believe in the incarnation. They don't believe, like we do, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. We talked about that last week, right? The fact that he's the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man in one. That he is that birth, that he came down and was born and lived in bodily form and was crucified in space, in time, on a cross, on a hill, in a particular place, with particular people. In other words, that it was a true historical event. They don't believe that. But we... As Christians do, and this is what many of the New Testament writers are fighting for. They're saying, look, this did not happen in somebody's mind. This did not happen in somebody's imagination. This is not Greek mythology. This is not, this may offend you, but it is what has been reported. It is what the gospel writers consistently tell us. Not only the gospel writers, but also the prophets of old. They pro pro prophesied the fact that he was going to come, and I'll, and, I'll get, and I'll mention one of those verses. He, they, he was going to come. He was going to be born. A, a virgin shall conceive. What a scandalous thing. And yet, it's happened. Yet, it's right there at the center of all that is. Why? Jesus came and took upon himself our flesh so that he could be the one to t carry our sin on the cross. He didn't do it as God. He did it as man for us. A perfect man. A second Adam. There was none amongst us that could have done it for us. Why? Paul clearly teaches, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There was nothing you had or I had to offer to God. What shall a man, I love Jesus, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. What are you going to give me, God says? What are you going to give me to make the tables right? What are you going to give me to balance things out? What are you possibly going to give me, the God, the creator of the ends of the earth? You who live endlessly offending me <laughs> and are not capable of my holiness, are separate from me. What are you going to give me? The only way to get this done is that I dress myself in flesh. I come, I take on your likeness for the purpose of death and death on a cross. And Jesus said, I'm not going to hold on to my comfy place here in the, in the kingdom. He said, I'm going to go down. I know what I'm, what's, what's waiting me, but I'm going down. I'm coming. I'm coming to take you with me. That's Jesus. That's why we love him so much. We were lost. Mm -hmm. Lost, people. And I think sometimes we don't, we don't, <clears throat> we think we're okay. You're not okay. Not in the big scheme of things. Not in the eternal view of things. In the eyes of God, you're not okay. Nobody is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Some of us are worse than others. <laughs> we get farther off than others. But anybody that gets off even a little bit to the right or to the left is lost. It doesn't matter how deep into sin you went. The fact is, you went. Mm -hmm. And we all have. I've never met a sinless creature. Mm -hmm. Truly, I've never met a sinless creature. I've met good men, good women, but I've never met a perfect woman. I've never met a perfect woman. <laughs> and I look at myself in the mirror a lot. Well, I actually don't. But, you know, <laughs> I examine my heart, and I find all kinds of things there that ought not to be there. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it seems like I'm hopelessly flawed. And yet, 
the high and lofty one who's called me, a contrite one, into his presence. And he made it possible through that veil of, of his flesh. Laid on that cross. Wow. He knew what was going to happen. John made it clear. He said the word was made flesh. And the word, of course, is Jesus. Further on, he said in his first epistle, second chapter, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. You see, now listen to the, to the verbs that he uses, okay? From the beginning, which we have heard. Mm -hmm. right? We're talking about physical things. That's why it's so important to grasp what John is saying. We have heard. We have seen with our eyes. In other words, he was here. <laughs> we didn't go there. It wasn't a vision. We weren't transported. He came from heaven to earth. We saw him. We heard him. Mm -hmm. Which we have looked upon and, and the, which our hands have handled. Just in case you're not getting what I'm saying. Look, my hands have handled. I have touched Jesus. I, I'm the apostle that laid on his breast. You know what I'm saying? I heard his heart beat. Physical heart beat. Making it very, very clear. Of the word of life, which was manifested unto us. So they go to this great lengths so that we will guard the truth of what his ears heard, his eyes saw and observed, and that which his hands handled. God made flesh. God dwelling amongst us. God dwelling and living here. So instead of being a source of bewilderment or, or scorn, the incarnation really should provoke us to the deepest sense of wonder and thankfulness. You know, how many of you, especially some of you older folks that are here today, <laughs> because it seems to happen with time, how many of you, how many of us have lost a true sense of wonder? You know, kids have a sense of wonder, a deep sense of wonder. Some of it turns, you know, and manifests in curiosity. You know, they, they look at and, and, and can make the most out of the simplest things. Or they still have this desire to look into something new. As you, as you get older, if you lose that sense of the wonder of life, the wonder of, of living, you basically just get routine. right? You get up, you go to work, you eat food, you come home, you watch a little TV, you go to bed, you get up the next day and you do the same thing over and over again. That, that's no way to live. You've lost your wonder. You've lost it. This is a good way to get it back. Amen. <laughs> to look at the wonder of mm -hmm. Jesus. And when your heart is pricked and provoked by thankfulness, Amen. it fuels wonder. And you look and you say, you are God in heaven, I am man on earth, and yet you have come to me. You came to me. I wasn't looking for you. You came to me. I was, I was sick in my sin. You came to me. You awoke me. You drew me by your spirit into fellowship with you. You broke the chains that held me. You set me free from sin and from death. And when these things begin to, uh, it feeds that sense of wonder. It feeds that sense of joy. I think joy is the expression of wonder. And I see way too little joy amongst us. That's true. I really do. I, I just to be honest. Just, and I think it's because we've lost the sense of wonder as to, to who Jesus is. You know, and what he, we've become too earthly minded. We really have. You know, people, people we, we, there are people who, who get too heavenly minded. You know, and they just spend life cloistered in a monastery. I get that. But we have gone the other way. We have become too practical and too pragmatic. We don't take enough time to just sit and wonder in the presence of Jesus and just look at who he is and all that he has prepared for us throughout all eternity. I, I, I want to think about that. I want to think about what's to come because what's to come is going to mold what's in my heart today. It's going to provoke me to thankfulness. It's going to keep wonder alive, a glow in my heart. You know, the Bible, it's a command that we have to be a glow with the Spirit. You know, it's a command. It's a Bible command. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 12. Be a glow with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's where that sense of wonder is living and you're joyful. And people's, people know 
that you're not just some boring religious thug. <laughs> That's your Bible. <coughs> you know, do something wrong, I'm going to whack you with it. <laughs> Show them the joy. <laughs> We hold the standards of God, but we hold the standards of God with great joy. That's right. I look at the holiness of God and I say, wonder of wonders. You're perfect. You know, all of you, we sing it, right? In all of your ways. I haven't sung yet, really, in this particular class. And now everybody's saying, well, thank you, Jesus, for small wonders. Amen. <laughs> but you're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all that. Just that I mean, you could just think, of, perfect in all of your ways. She said, Pastor Tommy, you're ready to sing that for us, you know? People that can actually sing my wife. Okay, so. Emmanuel. What does it mean? God with us. That's the name of Jesus. And that's the revelation, right? That's the thing that he clothed himself in flesh so he could unwrap himself to us, right? We get to know the heart of God because he veiled himself in the flesh. I love the verse of scripture. I mentioned it to you earlier. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah spoke and he said, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. That was probably the most clear prophecy of the of the coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ, the, the immaculate conception as it's known, right? Mm -hmm. The conception of the Holy Spirit through, uh, through the power of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in, in Mary. Now I'm just gonna read a little, a little bit to you because um, I just wanna stay on track, but I want I wanted to get into our, our teaching. And it's basically just the events of the incarnation, the, the time, the frame, the things that occurred when this word came to pass. So, at the fullness of time, an angel visited a Jewish priest, Zacharias, whose barren wife was named Elizabeth. Now, these if you just sit and kind of listen to the, to the story, you know, unanchored, <laughs> you kind of look at it and you think, man, that's some pretty wild stuff. You guys really believe that? I say, yep. Every word. I, I know the author. I know the author. <laughs> I know who he is, and although it sounds so hard to believe, knowing him, it's not hard to believe. You know, I, I've, I've, I've come to this, this. If God did things the way men do things, would he be God? No. No, he wouldn't. He'd just be another man. But if he does things in a way that is totally other than men, then he's probably God. And God does things, I think, in that manner to simply demonstrate. Look, my ways really aren't your ways. My thoughts, I don't think like you. I do things a totally different way. So don't be surprised when things occur that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. The whole rationale of miracles, and there is a whole rationale, if you will, about miracles. Why does God use it? Why does God do it? There's reasons. Anyway. He was, to, uh, he was told, Zacharias, that she, Elizabeth, would give birth to the man who would become known as John the Baptist, whose mission it was to prepare the way of the Lord by calling the people of God to repentance and faith. During that same season, the angel of the Lord visited a young girl, a virgin, and told her that she would give birth to the promised Messiah. Now that's a wild thing right there. An angel appearing and saying, you're, you know, you're 14, but you're going to be impregnated with, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've never known a man, she said. Well, don't worry about that, dear. I've got that covered, too. And you're going to give birth to the Messiah. And she believed it. She had great faith. Great faith. The power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary at the moment the angel indicated, and Emmanuel, God with us, was conceived. To confirm the whole situation to her, the Spirit arranged a meeting between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth, and I love this, where the babe in her womb leapt, and that's what ought to be happening to us. When that same babe comes near, 
It ought to cause us to leap, just like it caused John the Baptist to leap. There he is, probably six months old, in that, in that, in that watery cave. And he just gets wind, and he just hears with his ears the voice of Mary. And somehow the Spirit in him hooks up to the Spirit that's on her, and he knows who's near. And what does he do? He leaps for joy. When was the last time you did a somersault for Jesus? That's the car you're not serious now. You're not going to get doing summer. You know, I would not do that these days. <laughs> but there was a time when I would dance to the Lord with all my heart. I dance in my heart now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Pastor Tommy, he still dances. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I am dancing in my heart. I just got to be careful, you know. No, Lord, don't do it. <laughs> You ever dance this no. <laughs> So to confirm the whole situation to her, the spirit arranged a meeting between Mary and cousin Elizabeth. And the babe left the new woman and had the voice. Okay. To that, the spirit moved Elizabeth to declare. And this is, I love this. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. He leaped. John the Baptist leaped for joy when he heard the salutation of Mary. Now that's a weird thing, but it happened. It happened. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told to her from the Lord. So Jesus' birth came with what? A heavenly announcement. And I love it. You know, when God shows up, the angels come down singing. <laughs> da -da -da -da. I can just imagine what those shepherds saw. I mean, I don't know how many angels were there. One would be very impressive. But there was a myriad, it says, of angels who were there singing and shouting, and peace on earth and goodwill towards men. That's right. And they're looking up. Why? Well, a baby was just born. And they're part of the world. <laughs> Happens every day, doesn't it? <laughs> what is so special about this babe? Well, this babe is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And this babe is going to change everything. He is the focal point of history. And from the time of his birth and working it out and walking it out and his ministry and that which he will do for the redemption of men will change the course of human history. It will change the course of human lives. Amen. And it did. And it does. And it will. That's right. It will continue. That power will continue. That babe. That one little babe that was in the womb that was the source of John the Baptist's joy and power and preaching. That babe that changed your life mm -hmm. and my life. Amen. Amen. That little babe. He, uh, he was, everywhere he went, people started jumping and shouting. Even when he was walking on the face of the earth. People got so riled up, they, they got those palm leaves. You know, on the, the, what they call the triumphal entry when he came into Jerusalem just before they were going to crucify him. And all these kids are running around. Crazy kids. You can't control them. You know what I'm saying? You just can't. And Jesus is saying, don't control Don't you dare control them. Because if, if they don't start keep shouting out and rocking like this, these rocks are going to start screaming. Because there's so much joy because I am here. <laughs> and the little kids are the only ones that got it. They're grabbing these palms and they're running around and, and Hosanna to the highest! Woohoo! And they're just all in a frenzy, a little kitty frenzy. And Jesus was just loving it. Just loving it. Don't you ever separate a child that's rejoicing in Jesus from his Lord and Master. Jesus will not take kindly to you. Or an adult. Or an adult. Jesus will not take kindly to that. When we get all happy on the inside because Jesus is making us happy, just leave him alone. You just, you just, he got mad. Kids were coming to Jesus. They said, no, 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 don't come, don't bother the master. You, who do you think I came for? And if you don't get like them, you're not coming in. 
You don't get all happy, full of wonder, thankfulness, joyfulness, praise and worship and glory and everything. You ain't coming in. Sit outside with your kind. You dull people. <laughs> Gonna be happy up there, people. Amen. Gonna be happy up there. Not gonna be any more sorrow. Because the babe came. I love him, I love him, I love him. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then an amazing thing, an additional amazing thing happened, you know, right, right at his birth, to confirm and proclaim the arrival of this expected Messiah, the Holy Spirit prepared two of his servants. Two old folks. <laughs> Before we're talking about young folks, now we're talking about old folks filled with the Holy Spirit and had kept that sense of wonder in their hearts Amen. during their whole lives. Anna was one of them. Simeon was the other. Simeon prayed before the Lord and said, you know, Lord, he was inter an intercessor. And as he says that God said to him, you will see my Messiah. Can you imagine God telling somebody that nobody had ever heard of? He wasn't a part of the priestly gang. He was, he was just a guy who hung around the temple and worshipped God. And God singled him out and said, You are going to see my Messiah. He's on the scene. And then this old lady, who was widowed from a very young age and cloistered herself, basically became a nun, and says that, that her life was taken up with prayers and intercession and fasting. She was a seeker of God. To these two people, God revealed who that babe really was Good and point. confirmed to Mary and, that, and the whole family exactly who it was. So Simeon, a man was, who was just and devout and was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and I love this, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. I don't know a better way to live. You can have all your stuff. I want the Holy Ghost upon me. I want the Holy Ghost upon me, and I got it. And I got it. Thank you, Jesus. And Anna, a prophetess, powerful, a prophetess, one who spoke for God, the daughter of Fanua, Fanua, whatever, Simeon rejoiced and he declared, My eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And Anna, coming in, that very same place where Simeon was speaking about the Messiah, same moment, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's just amazing the way he sets these things up. In that instance, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all of them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Everybody that was in, looking for redemption. Every, all the Jews that knew the Messiah was coming to redeem. She spoke of them. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. When the Lord wants to, to, to break new ground and, and, and proclaim his word, he looks to a woman. Good idea. <laughs> I know that there's a lot of people that say, you know, women shouldn't preach and all that kind of stuff, but on these two particular instances, okay, at his birth, Anna is the one, it doesn't say anything about Simeon doing it. Yeah, he made this declaration, but Anna went to everybody. Everybody in there was, look, the Messiah's here! The Messiah's here! He's going to do it! He's going to do what the Messiah's going to do, and he's going to bring us back. And then at the end, after Jesus dies and is raised from the dead, who does, who does he appear to? Mary, another woman. And that woman takes off with a, a trailblazer. Back. He's alive! Amen. Now, I don't know. You can, you can take, you know, one verse that says women shouldn't preach. That's fine. And I, I, you know, hey, it's there. I don't think it's understood properly. But we do have these cases <laughs> that we need to take a good look at. And understand that the Spirit of God comes upon those that love Him. Yes. And when the Spirit of God comes upon those that love Him, he's, they speak in His name. And His gifts flow and work through Him. And I don't think we should cut off what God has done. I'm not against God's limits, but I don't think we should cut off what God wants to do. So He lived like us. <clears throat> the Gospels go to great 
lengths to demonstrate, as you can see, that Jesus was born a man. He came and he dwelt and he lived amongst us as a man. They show that he felt what we feel. They make no bones about it. He didn't live like in some kind of a, a Messiah ball. He was a carpenter after all. Huh? He built houses. <laughs> he carried logs. He made tables. He made chairs. He probably made yokes. All of these things. He was a man who got splinters. I hate splinters. But I'm sure, you know, there wasn't an angel over there looking over Jesus' fingers and making sure that poor Jesus didn't get a splinter. He got splinters, just like you and I got splinters. Get splinters. He feels what you and I have felt. He experienced hunger. He experienced thirst. And he grew tired. All of these things you can find in the Bible. When he was out in the desert, he was hungry. He was thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. He was on the cross. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. He, he, he was at a well with a little woman and said, Hey, I'm thirsty. Give me something to drink. He was sitting there. Why? Because he had journeyed for several days and he was tired. He knew the human condition. This is very important for where we're going. He fully understood and to this day understands the human condition without sinning, but he understood it because he was subjected to everything you and I are subjected to. We don't like to think about things like that. Jesus was tempted like I'm tempted? Yes. In every way. He was tempted to misuse his body. He was tempted to let his thoughts go crazy. He was tempted to, to, to exercise vengeance. He was tempted to not forgive. He was tempted to be proud and arrogant. He was tempted to be all of these things. It wasn't just the three temptations that are mentioned there, you know, in, Mark, in, uh, rather in uh, Matthew chapter 4. It said, it said that the devil came and left him for a little while. Well, what do you think he did after that little while? He came back and he tempted him more. We just don't have the story. Mm -hmm. Jesus was tempted. He experienced what we experienced. He so important. Tempted in every way without sin. Perhaps the most telling evidence that he became one of us is the fact that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's what Isaiah chapter 53 clearly tells us about the Messiah. And it's the one thing that the Jews simply couldn't understand or couldn't accept. It's the one part, even to this day, they don't attribute that chapter, the Jews that reject, reject Jesus don't attribute that particular chapter, which is so clearly talking about the Messiah, they don't attribute it to the Messiah. It was just a man, it was just somebody. No, it was the Messiah. It was Jesus. So he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He didn't get a pass. And you're not going to get a pass either. Every vessel that God will use, let me just preach to you for a moment. Every vessel that God will use is going to feel, feel the, the, the weight of life. Mm -hmm. And it's through the feeling of the weight of life that you are going to be transformed into a consoler. The Bible teaches us that when we fall into difficulties and problems, it is the Holy Spirit that comes to console us, to lift us, to strengthen us. And by that consolation that we have received, Paul said, we are then able to minister to those who, who find themselves in any difficulty. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you feel you're going to get a pass on everything? You're not. You're going to experience pain, suffering, sorrow, difficulty. But turn them into victories by ministering to somebody else. When you screw up and you sin and you you're down and out. Tell him, look, the mercy of God is going to meet you and he's going to lift you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to cleanse you. This is what he did in my life. I was down. I was beaten. I was bruised. I was hurt. I didn't know where to turn. And then he came. <laughs> tell them that. I was just thinking about that the other day. I want to tell people how good Jesus has been to me. I do. 
I want to tell people he has been good to me. I've gone through a lot of, a lot of harmful things, hard, not harmful, difficult things. Been pressed, like the song that we've been singing, you know, but pressed, but I'm sensing that new wine. Mm -hmm. I'm sensing right. that new wine coming out, yes. that joy of the Spirit of God. The pressing is is the press right. isn't pressing isn't forever. The pressing causes the juice to come out, and then it's fermented, and then it's prepared, and it sits for a little while, and it gets mature, and you pop that open, and you drink it, and glory to God, you're filled <laughs> with the new wine. Amen. And the joys of the Lord fill your heart. Oh, this is how I live. <laughs> This is how I live on the inside. I may not show it to you, but this is how I live. I show it to Jesus. And I'd like to show it to him a little bit more. Pastor Carl, you're getting a little weird tonight. It's all right. I'm okay. Just let me be like the child I was born to be. So Isaiah 53 describes the suffering servant of the Lord. It was foretold, but it came as a surprise. The Jews expected the manifestation of the Messiah, but not in the humble form he came or for the purpose that filled his heart. The Jews thought, and with good reason, the Messiah was coming as an indisputable world ruler. They thought he was coming to set up the kingdom. They thought he was coming to kick out the Romans. They thought he was coming to set them up as the ruling nation over all nations, over all people, and that everything was going to be run by the Jews with, with the Messiah at the head forever and ever. Well, they got part of it right. That's the second coming. <laughs> Amen. They missed the first coming. The first coming was the humble servant, you know, strolling into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey with the little, just the little children recognizing his greatness and glory. When he comes the second time, make no mistake, everybody will know. Every eye will see. And he will set up his kingdom. And there will be eternal peace because there won't be any problems and there won't be any troublemakers and there won't be any difficulty and there won't be any tears and there won't be any pain. Some of you say that doesn't even sound like life. It's not the life we know down here, but it is the life that we will know in heaven because he came. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Because he came. And he's coming again. Yes. I'm going to preach myself happy and I'm going to preach some of you happy too. I'm working it, man. I am working it. You need happy. It is perhaps an odd thing, you know, as I was mentioning, alluding to, that, you know, they didn't get the idea of the suffering servant of the Messiah as the suffering servant. In particular because their national life and their relationship with God was founded on what is known as the Day of Atonement. The, the primary day in the Jewish calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, from, from, from their beginning, their calling out of Egypt has been the Day of Atonement. And that is the day when the sacrifices are sacrifices and the, and the high priest goes into the very presence of God behind the veil and offers the blood there for the atonement or the covering of the sins of the Jewish people. That is the day of celebration. That is the day of release. That is the day that, that is meant to captivate most the heart of the Jew. And yet, when the, when the very lamb that God was sending to fulfill that act of atonement came, they didn't see it. They were fixed on the wrong thing. Jesus said they didn't understand the times and the seasons. They missed it. So Jesus became flesh to fulfill this ministry of the priesthood. And this is the part that I want to get to, and we're going to develop it and end with this tonight, because this, this is a, the priesthood is, is an amazing thing. So they look past the first phase to the work of the second, which is the rule of Messiah's king. However, the role of king of kings could not have come, and we could not come, without that of the priestly ministry. 
Jesus had to come as the last and the ultimate high priest. Not to offer sacrifices, other sacrifices, animal sacrifice for sin, but to offer himself. It was the high priest walking into the holy of holy himself and offering himself before God. Not bringing an animal, but bringing himself, his own flesh, to be the right. sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice yes. for the sins of the people. But it's not really atonement, it's really propitiation, which is it's different. Atonement means covering, right? The propitiation means wiping away. There's a difference. The Jews only knew the covering for sin, and they had a remembrance of it every year, right? But when Jesus came, he washed away our sins in his own blood. God doesn't remember. If you were to bring up yesterday's sins, he would say, what are you talking about, son? Of course, he knows you did it. But to him, it's a done thing. The forgiveness is complete and full. Because the forgiveness that Jesus gives wipes away sin, cleanses the palate, frees it, delivers our soul to, to where things are no longer remembered. So Jesus became flesh to fulfill the ministry of the great high priest. The work of the high priest is that of mediation. He mediates between God and man. A lot of times uh, families will need mediators. Okay, You talk about inheritances. I hate inheritances because I've had to be a mediator between people. Brothers and sisters who turn crazy over, yes, very long, very, very deep claws. Just people just become other people when inheritances are on the table. It's an amazing, it's a horrible thing. And you have to mediate sometimes. Sometimes everything falls on the mediator. Why? Because the mediator never gets it right no matter what he does. So if somebody asks you to be the mediator or the executor of the will or whatever, beware. Just go into it with your eyes open. Nobody's going to be satisfied. I don't care what they wrote. Everybody wants more than what they were supposed to get. So Jesus came as a mediator. All that to say this and try to explain that a mediator is one who stands in between, right? You have a party here, you have a party there, they're not, they're, they're at odds. You need somebody in the middle to bring them to the table and come to some reasonable conclusions, some reasonable workings out to where most parties, at least, can walk away and say, okay, that worked out. And, and the Bible says that that mediator, that that high priest, in particular Jesus, is a mediator between God, the Holy One, and man, the sinful one. He's a mediator. And he came to do it. He had to be wrapped in flesh to do it. Paul said there is one God and one mediator between God and man. And it's very interesting that he says, the man Christ Jesus. He doesn't say the Son of God. He says, the man, Christ Jesus. So there's this perfect identification between Jesus, the Messiah, the one born, conceived as a man, with you and with I. There's a perfect identification. He's human just like you're human. He's also God, just like God is God. But he's, he's every bit human as we are human. And he stands before God. He's the only one. He's unique, right? We talked about that. He is unique. Nobody is like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he's the only one who could stand between a holy God who was, who was pouring out his wrath on a sinful, sinful people. Right. And he was the only one that could stop and say, but I have offered the sacrifice in my own life. And I've offered it for all those that come and believe and accept the gospel. Those who believe and repent of their sins. They're under my cover. They're in my covenant. So he becomes the mediator of this new covenant. This agreement that God makes between men and himself. We have an agreement with God. Do you know that? Yes. It's an amazing thing. We, I can't remember the last time I heard a good message on covenant. I think most of us just don't have, t don't have the patience for it. But if you start to get in the fact that we have a covenant with God and start to unveil that thing because it is the foundation of your relationship with God. 
We celebrate it on the day, you know, where we take Holy Communion. That is the covenant meal. Uh, it's, it's meant to cause us to remember our covenant. And what is it that? The agreement that God has made with us. He says, he says I'll, I'll set you free from sin, and I'll give you everything in my kingdom. <laughs> Basically what it is. He doesn't get anything but us. And to him, that's a good deal. He loves us. But then he says, you will be co-inheritors of my son, so that everything he has is yours. All hold part, baby. Everything we have is Jesus. We're co heirs. Glory. Co heirs. And he made this possible because why? He came. He came. Had he not come, it wouldn't be possible. So the great difference between the high priest of the Old Testament and that of Jesus is that the high priest offered sacrifices according to the law. Right? You bring a couple of animals, you slaughter them, you burn them take the fat off, you know, separate them. There was a whole process by which they did these things, offered that sacrifice, and they were atoned. So there was that. And then there was Jesus who came to offer himself as the final sacrifice. And let me look in, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse uh, 27. It says... He has no need, Jesus, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his, for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He did this once for all when he offered up what? Himself. He offered up himself. That's in Hebrews 7, 27. And then also in Hebrews 9, 25 through 28, it says, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, Jesus, as the high priest enters the holy place yearly with blood, not his own. For then he would have to have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin. This is it's not covering sin. He's talking about putting away sin. Different. What happened under the old covenant is different what happened in the new. Putting away sin by the sacrifice of what? Himself. And just as it appointed uh, unto men once to die, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are e eagerly awaiting Him. Amen. So this is what we're seeing that Jesus is doing. So the book of Hebrews, and, and we're going to go back now into uh, chapter 2 gives us powerful insights as to why the great mediator had to partake of flesh and blood. He had to partake of this flesh and blood. He had to be identified with us. He had to experience what we experience. And we're going to find out why he had to do that. So chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 14. I mean just read, you can read the whole chapter. I mean that would be really good. But I'm just going to read the part that I feel will help us the most in this class. Okay, so, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, you and I, right? He himself likewise partook of the same nature. He was flesh and blood, just like you and I. That through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. And to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. For surely it is not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in every aspect. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make expiation for the sins of man. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. He had to take upon himself and live the human condition so that he could be, for you and I, a faithful, eternal high priest. It wasn't just the fact of, the, of what he did on the cross, but what he does today. In, seven, in chapter 7 of, of Hebrews, verse 25, it says that Jesus ever liveth to what? 
make intercession for you and for me. Now let's just look at this briefly um, regarding regarding some of the things that it says. Since since they took uh, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same nature. Why? That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So the first thing was to destroy Satan, to destroy his, his network, to destroy his work, to destroy all that he had done. And Jesus on the cross has done that. He Amen. paid the sin. He, he, he gave that ransom to God for our sins. He set us free. So the death dealer is no longer at the table. He can no longer deal out death. He's been stripped of that authority, stripped of that power. He can no longer do it. Jesus had to become a man to be able to do that. Second, to deliver those who through fear of death huh, were subject to lifelong bondage. And now, if you, if you ever try to talk to people about death, you will find that most people don't want to open up the subject. Most people, oh, that's morbid. Why would you want to talk about that? I don't want to talk about death. I'm living. I'm alive. Talk to me about death when I'm on my deathbed. No. You need to talk about death now. You do. You need to talk to people about death now. Because people live in bondage to death. They, people are constantly thinking, what's going to happen to me when I die? Don't think that, that our society has become so sophisticated that they're not thinking that anymore. We aren't. We are still thinking, what happens after the veil? And anybody that has an inkling of God, anybody that has a thought that, you know, maybe they're agnostic, they don't, they're not sure, but there could be fear strikes their hearts when they know that this God that created all things is perfect in all his way, and they know. They know. It's kind of, it's kind of funny to me, you know, because in, 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 the, in the general discourse out there, people will... People will say that atheists, you know, they, they have no morals. And I said, no, they have morals. They absolutely have morals. They know right from wrong. Why? Because God planted it in them. They just don't like it. And they don't submit to it. But they know, just like you know, that you're doing wrong when you're doing wrong. It's just that they've allowed their hearts to become so hard that they don't care anymore. And people get to that place where they just don't care anymore. But when there comes a pricking from the Holy Spirit and his presence come, comes near or a thought comes near or you read something about people just, you know, there, there's different stories out there, right, that you hear on the news that for some reason just get personal. We can hear about tragedies all the time. And it's amazing how much tragedy we can just leaf through, you know, and through the daily paper. But sometimes something just sticks. And it, and, and it sends literally a shiver down your spine. That's the Holy Spirit reminding you. There's a day coming. There's a day of judgment coming. And man is living under that sense of a coming day of judgment. They know. We bury it, but they know. But Jesus came to set us free from that fear. Mm -hmm. He came to set us free from that fear. And, and when we are perfected in love, that fear of judgment disappears. That's what John teaches us. Perfect love huh? casts out fear. If you go and you read the, the passage specifically, it's talking about the fear of judgment. It's talking about that particular fear. Now you can look at it and say, okay, fear that we experience in our daily lives, okay, you can apply it there. But specifically speaking, it's talking about the fear of judgment. And when you know that the love of God is operable in your life, you know that you're on God's side and you know you have that proof mm -hmm. of his presence and work in your life, it, it, it eliminates that fear of death. I don't have a fear of death. Sometimes, sometimes I find myself rejoicing of the coming day. Sometimes I go, oh, hold on, Carl, you're not that old yet. God still has a fear of death. But let me tell you something. When I got that sense that I'm done, I'm going to say, Lord, I'm still waiting, God. Come on now, Lord, get me out of here. I'm done. I've finished that last, I've crossed that last, that last T, dotted that last I. I'm ready. Let's go. I used to have an aunt that constantly say that. We'd take her anyway. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And I'm always saying to the Lord, let's go. <laughs> let's get this done. Okay. 
For surely it's not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. In other words, that Jesus didn't come as an angel. He came as a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like unto his brethren in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. How else could a high priest work with us sinful creatures? Unless he was merciful and faithful. Merciful to us and faithful to God. Why? Because he has to hold the standard of God. But because we don't and we sin, he has to be able to show mercy. So he's faithful to God, but he's merciful to man. And as he's working to perfect us, he brings us into the realization of that perfection that he has demonstrated. So he remains faithful to God as a high priest, but he's also merciful to us. He knows what we're like. And you can look at, I mean, there's just so many different verses um, on this particular subject. You know, Hebrews chapter 4, for we have not a high priest, verse 15, we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. That has saved me. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? If I thought that Jesus couldn't sympathize with my human weaknesses, how could I possibly stand in his presence? Because I'm so aware of them. Not that they're constantly crushing in on me or anything, but, but I am aware of my weakness. The Apostle Paul was acutely aware of his weakness, and that's why he prayed to the Lord. That's why he rejoiced. And Jesus said, look, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul said, I'd rather glory in my weaknesses and my infirmities and all of these things. Because the power of Christ will rest upon me to give me victory over. So Jesus had to be of such a temper that he would be holy always to God and yet could extend the hand of mercy to men. Because he walked in both shoes. Mm -hmm. He knows why God has to be holy. He knows why God can't change his ways. He never will. Mm -hmm. I've got a message I'll bring forth one of these days about tolerance <laughs> and the fact that God is completely intolerant, but he is also completely merciful. It's a beautiful thing. So we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And this is where the verse comes from. This is all the theology right behind this verse that we use practically. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. But all this stuff about Jesus coming in the flesh and living and experiencing what we experience, overcoming it, not succumbing to the, to the thing and then winning the victory on the cross, that's the whole basis for us being able to come to that throne room of grace and mercy and find it when we need it. When we're in our low spot, when we're in our difficulty, when we're feeling the temptation crushing in on us, or we have succumbed to temptation and we need forgiveness. Jesus is that faithful high priest. He's the one saying, Son, come. Come through me. Amen. Come through me. You know, sometimes as you're, as you're growing in Christ, as you're, as you're mature in Christ, sometimes you're surprised by your own sin. I was talking to Pastor Bob a little bit today, being surprised by certain things. Surprised by your own sin is kind of like, man, that, that, that shouldn't be happening. That, that shouldn't be happening. And, and, and I was talking to God about some of this. And, and, it, and it was like, well, sin. So, son, my mercy is still where it's torture. It's, I haven't changed. You need my mercy? Ask for it. Mm -hmm. You need my forgiveness? Ask for it. Mm -hmm. You're not above it. You still need it. You still need the grace. You still need the mercy. You still need my help. Yes. Amen. Just because you've grown and learned and, and walked this out to, for, to a certain degree doesn't mean you don't still need my mercy. You still need it. Right. And it's still available. And I just Amen. thank you, thank Jesus. God. Amen. Amen. So we have that merciful high priest who ministers to us in our misery, in our difficulty, in our broken heart, and lifts us and strengthens us. He doesn't cast us away. He doesn't throw us away. Mm -hmm. He may get angry. He may breathe down our neck. He may correct us and make it feel ouch, ouch, but he still yeah. loves and lifts. Yes. Mm -hmm. He loves yes. and lifts. Yes. 
Grace does much more about. Amen. The high priest. Going back to just finish finish that last one where we were seeing why he had to be like us. So they become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. To make expiation or make himself a sacrifice for our sins. To wipe our sins away. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Humble, meek. That's Amen. not Jesus. The great high priest Amen. who sits ready to draw us, to forgive us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to lift us, to restore us, to fill us again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. The mercy of God. I was, I was meditating. Let me just give you this one verse to kind of... It's in Lamentations. It's beautiful. It's truly beautiful. This is, this is true beauty. Right? Now I'm going to give you the King James. Hold on. For this I call to mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So you see the two? Huh? The mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Amen. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And the very last thing I want to show you about this, I got, oh, I'm a minute over. <laughs> it's worth it. This ministry is not exclusive to Jesus. This priestly ministry. We have actually been called into it. Mm -hmm to exercise this ministry here on earth. This is the way Peter said it. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then in verse 9, you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. Amen. And finally, Revelation 1, 5, and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto our God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And then he finally finishes it in Revelation 5.10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. He's our king priest. Because he came, wrapped himself in flesh, experienced all that we experienced, and then gave his life for us. And now sits to make intercession for us. So that when we stumble, he comes to us, lifts us, cleanses us, shows us mercy, shows us the path, restores our mind, our hearts, brings us back into fellowship with God mm -hmm. because we've been contrite before him. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, and give thanks, first of all, that you are this, this wonderful Jesus of ours. You are God. You are, you are creator. You are Lord of lords. But you are also friend. You are also 
man, just like we are man. And you have, you have passed through all the streams that we've passed through. You've known the floods that we have known. You've known the storms, Lord God, of all of life. You've been tempted as we have been tempted, yet without sin. And therefore, you stretch down your hand, although you sit at the right hand of the Father, and you draw us unto yourself, and you pull us unto yourself, and you give us, hallelujah, grace and mercy, hallelujah, when we need it, Lord God, most. So I pray, God, that you would supply, Lord, what your people need tonight, that those that are struggling with sin, those that are feel that lash of temptation, those, Heavenly Father, that sense that depression or oppression, God, that you break those yokes, and you give them freedom, and you minister the covenant life to them, Father, because you're the great high priest, yes, Jesus. Lord. Work in our hearts and work in this life and, 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 and fulfill your will in Jesus' holy name and pray. Amen. Amen.